when I was a kid, I think I believed that the actors were the ones who really made the movies go because you see them all the time and they're on screen making the plot happen. But then, of course, you get a little bit older and you realize that no, it's the director. There's a barely mentioned person off screen whose name you might not even have caught who's overseeing all of it and they set the agenda and the pace, even though it might seem mostly creditless to the average viewer. Likewise, in the Bible, you got a handful of characters here who don't get a lot of screen time, but they have a disproportionately significant amount of influence. And one such character in the New Testament is a guy named Annas. He was a high priest who only gets mentioned four times by name in the Bible, once in Luke, once in Acts, and a couple times in John. But by merit of his role and by merit of what he did after he was done serving in that role, he's kind of the guy who drives the whole opposition to Jesus that makes the narrative go in the Gospels and the New Testament in general. Here's what I mean. Annas gets appointed to the role of high priest in 6 AD by the Roman governor of Syria, a guy named Quirinius, who's famous for the census business and the birth story of Jesus in Luke 2. And he holds that position until 15 AD when he gets deposed by Pontius Pilate's Roman predecessor, a guy we know very little about named Valerius Gratus. But what we know about Annas is that he was the first high priest to be appointed. The previous high priests, according to the first century historian Josephus, who's just a treasure trove of knowledge about New Testament times, the previous high priest, whose name was, second I forget it, Joazar, was deprived of that title by the governor of Syria named Quirinius. This is the guy who's associated with the census at the beginning of Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story. So Quirinius is like, nah, even though the multitudes picked you, even though you were chosen by your own brethren to be the mediator between God and man for the Jewish people, I am depriving you of that position because I, as a Roman governor, see the political value of this role of high priest in making things the way I want them to be in this part of the world. So I'm going to appoint somebody who's more cooperative. And that is when Josephus tells us that this Annas fellow is appointed. Uh, conferred on him, and he appointed Annas, the son of Seth, to be high priest. And we know that Annas was in charge starting in 6 AD and up through 15 AD. That's a comparatively long run, but apparently, having been appointed by a Roman governor, he found the favor of that Roman governor, knew what he wanted, was able to cooperate in a way that worked. And this really, I believe, transformed the relationship between the high priesthood and the government, as well as the relationship between the high priesthood and your average Joe, your run-of-the-mill citizens, your Jewish people who are still living out the paces of the Jewish religion. And I think there's a problem here because the Romans are an occupying army. They're conquerors. I mean, they don't care about God or the Old Testament or the Messiah or the sacrifices or any of this stuff. They just want stability. So they're not going to pick people who will be the best at understanding the scriptures and providing meaningful religious leadership to the people. They want folks who will accomplish their political goals. And Annas represents the first in a long line of high priests who are selected this way. But at the most basic level, the high priest is supposed to be a mediator between God and men. But that's a narrative problem when Jesus comes on the scene. Because Jesus, as the Messiah, the Christ, God in the flesh, he is the mediator between God and men, the ultimate one, the, the mediator between God and men who is the fulfillment of of the earthly incomplete image that is the political office of high priest. Jesus is the true high priest. It says that in Hebrews 9, Hebrews 10, very famously, this is spelled out in 1 Timothy 2. You've probably even heard this one before. Verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So you got a collision course here. Now, obviously, we all picture the images of Jesus on the cross and Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, the sign that was placed above him. And it's like, oh, well, he was a king, but the Romans already had a king. We have no king but Caesar. So there's your narrative collision course. Well, sure. But the Romans don't come up very much until you get to the end of each of the gospel stories about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. The enemy who's on screen trying to thwart Jesus at every turn, it's the Pharisees. It's the state-appointed 
religious leadership class. And so there really is this second collision course that is more than any tension with Rome, what drives the narrative beats forward of the gospel toward this inevitable confrontation that has to happen. They can't both occupy the same space at the same time. Either the institution of high priest must continue, and they're going to do the job of connecting people with God, or Jesus really is the Messiah, God in the flesh, and that is the ultimate bridging of the gap, which would mean that this high priestly role really wouldn't need to exist anymore, and that would be financially and politically devastating for the people who held that title. No surprise then that ultimately they ended up using the power of the state to wrongfully and unjustly have Jesus executed. But this Annas fellow, he's not in charge when Jesus gets executed, so why does he matter so much? Well, we get both from the New Testament and from extra-biblical sources like Josephus the explanation that Annas had a big family, and even after he is deposed by Valerius Gratus, another Roman governor who's the predecessor to the very famous Pontius Pilate, he still wields influence because after a couple of failed high priests who came and went very quickly, his son-in-law, Caiaphas, gets appointed to the high priesthood, and Caiaphas is very successful in that role from a political perspective. He cooperates with one governor, Valerius Gratus, cooperates very well with another, Pontius Pilate, continues beyond even that administration. And in doing so, he builds quite the name, quite the reputation for the family. He builds on what his father-in-law had accomplished. Also, Caiaphas would be incentivized to keep his father-in-law, Annas, around. Let him keep the title of high priest. Why would you be stripped of that honorific? Did a nice job. You did it for nine years. So we see that Annas is involved in the affairs of the temple. He's showing up at these trials and these events in Acts chapter 4. Annas is a very old man who hasn't been high priest for 20-ish years. He's still there, and he even has the power to govern over that assembly where they got after Peter and John for continuing to do the Jesus stuff after they told him to knock it off. Annas, in the book of John, is described as being the first of the Jewish leaders to actually talk to Jesus and try him the night that Jesus is arrested in the garden. Under cover of darkness, of course, Jesus gets arrested, and the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all move Jesus from the arrest to the palace or the home of the sitting high priest, Caiaphas, where Jesus is given a a kangaroo court trial and, of course, found guilty. But John gives us the little wrinkle and the added detail that he was first taken to the palace of Annas, giving us the impression that in the same way you might be able to imagine some of the political puppet masters in media or politics who have worked behind the scenes and occasionally in front of the scenes for the last 20, 30, 50 years to make things the way they want, we get the impression by John including this detail Annas is pulling some strings behind the scenes, though he might not have that pinnacle title anymore. Well, Josephus goes on to tell us that Annas has a bunch of kids, some of whom have the same name as him. Sometimes it's rendered uh, Ananias and Nanus, and so it can get a little bit confusing, but if we read Josephus carefully, we can separate it out. And what we find is that Josephus has actually got a little bit of a favorable view of the original Annas who is present but not fully in charge at the time of Jesus' trial and execution. Because by contrast, Josephus points to his descendants as being less competent. For example, in the Antiquities of the Jews, again by Josephus, Book 20, Chapter 9, Josephus writes this, And now Caesar, upon hearing of the death of Festus, uh, a later governor, sent Albinus into Judea as procurator. I'm giving you a bunch of details you don't need. Uh, here we go. But the king deprived Joseph of the high priesthood and bestowed the succession to that dignity on the son of Ananus, who was himself called Ananus or Annas. Now, the report goes that this elder Ananus proved a most fortunate man, for he had five sons. That's the guy we're talking about, five sons. And they all performed the office of high priest. And we know a son-in-law who performed that office as well. What? A massively, almost dynastic character then we understand Annas to be with huge influence over these kids and future generations. And it says that Annas himself enjoyed the dignity of a long time formerly, which he had which had never happened to any other of our high priests. So Josephus likes him. But 
This younger Ananius, or Annas, who, as we have told you already, took the high priesthood and was a bold man in his temper and very insolent. And he was also of the sect of the Sadducees who were very rigid in judging offenders above all the rest of the Jews, as we've already observed. When, therefore, this younger Annas was of this disposition, he thought he had now a proper opportunity to exercise his authority. Ephesus was dead. Again, that's a later governor. And Albinus was but upon the road. So he assembled, that being this younger Annas, he assembled the Sanhedrin of Judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus of Nazareth, who was called Christ, whose name, this brother, was James and some others, or some of James and Jesus' companions. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. But as for those who seemed the most equitable of the citizens, and such they were uneasy at the breach of the laws. They disliked what was done. And then they start taking political action to do something about this lousy appointed descendant of Annas, who a few decades after the fact is now executing Jesus' followers. That's a really important detail, right? We see that Annas the elder is still casting this long shadow, but there's a deterioration in the quality of these descendants as they occupy the role. And by the time we're getting down to his younger sons, they're just bloodthirsty and judgmental and stupid. And Josephus seems to be saying, look, they destabilized things. They didn't understand their function. They made stupid moves and stuff got worse. And that moves us toward the Jewish rebellion and all the chaos that ensues in 70 AD. So Josephus has a high view of Annas and a lower view of his descendants. Interesting that we get that extra biblical read. But the bottom line with this character, I think, comes down to this. Though he might have had redeeming qualities, and though by contrast with his descendants, he might have looked better from a, a Jewish or even a Roman perspective, there is still an inherent tension that is set in place. Annas represents the beginning of a tradition by which a secular sword-wielding, governing authority appoints a mediator between the Jews and God by the force of the state to uphold the values of the state. Jesus, on the other hand, is appointed not even by the people, but by God, the God of Abraham, the God of Israel, the God of all creation, the God of all things. In fact, he is God in the flesh. He's the promised king, the Christ, the Messiah, the high priest. He's all the fulfillment of all of the stuff that was the whole Bible and the theological story at the time the New Testament happens. So you have a state-appointed high priest and a God-appointed high priest. The state-appointed high priest and his descendants advance world kingdom values, priorities, and agenda. Jesus is advancing kingdom of God values and priorities and agenda. As a result, something's got to give. And the way ultimately it gives is the New Testament holding it out as though God used the evil and the corruptedness of the men who held this position to take Jesus to where he was supposed to go all along, and that is to the cross where he would die as a sacrifice for sins, as an atoning sacrifice, where he would die for the sins of many as the Redeemer, as we see in that passage that I was reading in 1 Timothy chapter 2 a little bit earlier. Annas then plays a huge role in the politics of this age, and in the ensuing decades, he plays a significant role in the tensions that move forward the early church after the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, and he also plays a very significant role in the grand redemptive story arc of God's work to redeem humanity through the work of Christ on the cross, because unwittingly, Annas pushed the narrative toward the direction that ultimately put Christ on the cross, which is the theological centerpiece of God's redemptive plan. Pretty interesting, I thought. Thanks to everybody who supports the program at patreon.com slash tmbh. This exists because you do that, so thank you for making this happen. Additionally, one quick note, you might have noticed that I'm doing more short videos on this channel, like the official YouTube shorts. YouTube seems to really want creators to do that. If you don't do it, it seems like you're not getting put in front of people quite as much. And I want to keep doing this. And also shorts are kind of fun. So you're going to see more of those on the channel moving forward, but you're also going to keep seeing stuff like this because I love doing it and this is a blast. All right, I'm Matt. Thanks for hanging out with me. Let's do this again soon.